For many of us today, old-fashioned phone calls and voicemails are more inconvenient than helpful. We often find that text messages are quicker and more to the point, allowing us to continue on with our day in a timely manner. However, there are some cold cases where voicemails are an important and sometimes perplexing clue. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two chilling unsolved cases with strange voicemails. But first, I'd like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. If you're a regular Cold Case Detective audience member, chances are you've heard us discuss our creative partnership with Magellan TV, the number one source for the best and most original true crime content available anywhere on Earth. You know about their well-crafted documentaries and brilliant TV shows, and how they expand beyond true crime to deliver fantastic outlooks in other subjects, like science or culture or the paranormal. In other words, there is always something to binge, no matter what you're interested in. This week, we want to highlight the true crime documentary, Jack the Ripper, the German Suspect, a 50-minute inspection of one of the most notorious unsolved serial murder cases in all of human history. You may think you know all the suspects and theories behind Jack the Ripper, but what if we told you one of the less discussed suspects might be the best fit for the demented killer's identity? That's one of our favorite aspects of this documentary, how it takes a case talked about ad nauseum and makes it interesting and refreshing. It is also just a great piece of historical filmmaking and a detailed biography about a unique person of interest. It's the perfect mix of true crime and history, exactly how we curate some of our own videos on Cold Case Detective. Jack the Ripper, the German suspect, is also a new release, part of Magellan TV's 15 to 20 hours of brand new content they add to their library every week, always leaving fans of true crime and other relevant topics with something fresh to binge and enjoy. Use the link in the description below to access a free month trial and jump into the blood-curdling history of Jack the Ripper, the German suspect, and other top-notch documentaries. You might just be the one to solve the case. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. Brandon Graves. Born March 12th, 1985, little is documented about Brandon Graves' early life, likely due to the fact that his case has never received the media attention it deserves. Estranged from his father, Brandon was raised by his aunt, Martha German, and uncle, Larry. His mother had passed away when he was just three years old. His older sister described her sibling as a quiet, laid-back type of person. He's a very friendly person, most times you see him, he's always smiling. He's easy to get along with. Raised in Little Rock, South Carolina, Brandon attended Morris College in Sumter for one year before transferring to Coastal Carolina University, located in Conway, South Carolina. Here, he was a student trainer for the university's football team. He graduated in December of 2008, walking away with a degree in sports management. At the time of his disappearance, Brandon lived and worked in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. On January 30th, 2010, aged just 24, he decided to take a spur-of-the-moment trip to attend homecoming at Morris College, where he planned to meet up with the members of his old fraternity. He called his girlfriend while he was on his way to Sumter, and then called another friend shortly after he arrived. At around 11 p.m. that evening, Brandon and two of his friends went to Sebastian's nightlife, a nightclub on the 3200 block of Broad Street. Just before midnight, however, he was asked to leave by a bouncer who thought he was behaving in an extremely drunk and unruly manner. A few minutes later, Brandon attempted to re-enter the club, but the bouncer refused, and security staff quickly escorted the 24-year-old off the property. He can reportedly be seen on CCTV walking away from the club, appearing upset, although this footage does not appear to have been made public. 
although Brandon was removed for his alleged unruly behavior. The club manager told WLTX that he was nearby at the time of the incident, and stated that while the young man was intoxicated, he was not out of hand, but, quote, we didn't want any trouble, so we told him he had to leave for the night. According to one of Brandon's friends, the 24-year-old spoke to a group of people after he left the club. Following this, it is believed that he may have decided to go to another club nearby, which was possibly named Blue Mist, and to get there, he had gotten into a white car with an unidentified driver. However, this sighting is unconfirmed. In the early hours of the morning, Brandon made two phone calls, one to a friend and one to his cousin. Neither answered the phone, and so Brandon opted to leave the pair voicemails. According to the Charlie Project, his voice was unintelligible, possibly because he was drunk. This was the last time that anybody heard from the 24-year-old, with the last message being left between 3.30 and 4 a.m. These voicemails have never been released to the public. Afterwards, Brandon's phone went straight to voicemail. He was reported missing on February 1st, and authorities have since been unable to determine where the young man was when he left the voicemails. Initially, authorities did not feel that there was anything to indicate that Brandon was in immediate danger. However, just five days later, on February 6th, they announced that they suspected foul play was involved with his disappearance. Brandon's two friends, who were with him on the night he went missing, were interviewed by police. One of the men passed a polygraph test, while the other refused to take one. Reportedly, the friend who'd refused had actually accompanied him to Sumter from Myrtle Beach. Brandon's cousin told law enforcement that the pair had argued earlier on January 30th, because the friend showed up at Brandon's house unannounced and uninvited, asking if he could stay. This man was eventually considered a person of interest in the case, but has never been publicly identified and has never been charged. In February of 2010, authorities received an anonymous tip that led them to a man from Clarendon County who they considered a person of interest. It's unclear what this man's involvement is with the case, and whether or not he is still considered a suspect. By all accounts, Brandon's disappearance is uncharacteristic. Although he enjoyed the odd spontaneous trip, he always kept his aunt and uncle informed of his whereabouts and had never vanished off the face of the earth before. The 24-year-old had no criminal record, was not involved with drugs or drug dealers, and was well-liked with no known enemies. A 2019 article has noted that the driver of the white car Brandon allegedly entered has never been identified. Due to the lack of coverage, there have been few theories in Brandon's case. Some online sleuths suspect that his friend was involved, while others believe the driver of the white vehicle played a part. It's also been theorized that Brandon's disappearance is the result of a simple, drunken accident, or that he left of his own accord, although his family and friends dispute this idea. As of 2020, they believe that he is alive and being held against his will. 24-year-old Brandon Graves was last seen just before midnight on January 31st, 2010, when he left Sebastian's Nightlife, a nightclub in the 3200 block of Broad Street, Sumter, South Carolina. He possibly entered a white vehicle with an unknown driver afterwards. When he was last seen, Brandon was wearing a blue t-shirt over a black thermal shirt, black jeans, and a black baseball cap. He is an African-American male with black hair, which was styled in long dreadlocks at the time of his disappearance and brown eyes. He is around five foot four and weighed 150 pounds when last seen. He may go by the nickname Peanut, fondly given to him by his family for his small stature. Additionally, Brandon is asthmatic and takes regular medication for the condition. If he is still alive, he will be 36 years old. If you have any information about Brandon's disappearance, you can call the Sumter County Sheriff's Office on 803-436-2000, or you can call South Carolina's Crime Stoppers on 1-800-274-6372. Debbie Wolf. On Christmas Day of 1985, 28-year-old Debbie Wolf finished her shift as a nurse at the Veterans Hospital on Ramsey Street in Fayetteville, North Carolina, with the intention of heading home. However, it is unclear whether or not the young woman did so. The following morning at 8 a.m., she failed to turn up for her scheduled shift at work. As a punctual and hard worker, her colleagues found this odd, as she didn't even call in to report her absence. 
Her mother, Jenny Edwards, grew more alarmed when she found that she couldn't make contact with her daughter. Jenny, alongside a family friend named Kevin Gorton, decided to go to Debbie's home to check on her. The 28-year-old's isolated cabin was located around four miles outside of Fayetteville. When the pair arrived, they immediately felt that something was amiss. Debbie's normally immaculate front garden was littered with beer cans, and her two dogs, who were always well cared for and well behaved, were running loose in the garden and had yet to be fed. However, things only grew stranger from there. Debbie's vehicle was parked in a spot that it was never usually parked in, and the driver's seat had been pushed right back. The 28-year-old normally had it pulled far forward, as she was only five foot three. Additionally, inside, her home was in disarray. It was always neat and tidy, but personal items were scattered on the floor, and her handbag was found stuffed underneath her bed. A short-sleeved nurse's uniform was found discarded on the kitchen floor, but oddly, it wasn't the one Debbie was wearing when she was last seen. Her co-workers recalled that she'd been wearing a long sleeve uniform, which was more appropriate for the colder months, and it had a coffee stain on the sleeve from where a colleague had spilt their drink earlier on the morning of December 25th. Debbie herself was nowhere to be seen. As Jenny and Kevin explored the house, they noticed there was a new message on Debbie's answering machine. When they pressed play, a male voice that Jenny didn't recognize asked how Debbie was doing, claiming to be from the hospital and noting that she had missed a few days work. We will play the message for you now. Hey Deb, miss you here at work today. I uh, just wondering how you're doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at day 227007, or I'll give me a call at home tonight. Uh, you've been having a lot of days, you made me worry when you miss another one. I just wanna make sure you're okay. Bye. Jenny found the mention of her daughter's absence from work odd, as at this point, Debbie had only missed a morning at work, not even a full day, never mind multiple. Online sleuths have wondered if the caller meant that she had been absent more frequently from work, rather than that she had missed several consecutive days. Others, however, feel that the caller was involved with Debbie's disappearance, and they didn't think anyone would check her answering machine for a few days. Following the discovery of this message, Jenny and Kevin finished searching the house and checked the surrounding area, including the edges of the pond in Debbie's garden. However, they found no further clues, and so Jenny alerted the police. Captain Jack Watts was one of the officers who first arrived on the scene, and he brought with him a sniffer dog who turned up no new leads. Although it's unclear why, Watts assumed that Jenny and Kevin, two civilians with no equipment, had already searched the pond, and so he did not request that divers come to the scene. This inaction continued for a few days until Jenny, frustrated by the lack of movement in the case, finally requested that Kevin search the pond, along with his friend, Gordon Childress. The two had a fair amount of diving and rescue experience. Of this blunder on the police's part, Captain Watts said, quote, I think it was mentioned that they had already looked in the pond. There was no use for us to look in the pond, so I don't think we did a dive of the pond or a complete search of the pond on that day. No, we did not. On January 1st, 1986, Kevin and Gordon made their dive into the pond for clues. Gordon reportedly saw two sets of footprints in the mud at the bottom of the pond and quickly spotted drag marks shortly after this. Just moments later, he saw Debbie's body. She was 30 feet from the bank and in about five and a half feet of water. Oddly, her body was inside a burn barrel, which Gordon described as a rusty 55 gallon oil drum type thing with holes in it. Jenny believed this drum was the one her daughter used to store firewood in, noting that that particular barrel was missing from the garden, but that there were indentations on the ground where it had once stood. The following day, Debbie's autopsy was carried out by Dr. William Oliver from the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. Oliver fully believed he would find all the hallmarks of a woman who'd accidentally fallen and drowned, and was surprised to find that Debbie had only a teaspoon of water in her upper bronchial area, no signs of froth or foam in her mouth or airway, and even had abrasions to her fingers, which suggested she'd grappled with somebody. Additionally, it was noted that Debbie's body appeared relaxed and at ease, while many drowning victims are found with clawed hands and an open mouth and eyes as they struggled. It is unclear when Debbie's body entered the water as well, as she showed no signs of bloating or discoloration. 
In fact, her body was in such good condition that Jenny was able to host an open casket funeral for her daughter. There were no traces of drugs or alcohol in her system. Ultimately, Dr. Oliver couldn't discern whether or not Debbie died by her own hand or somebody else's, and her cause of death has never been determined. Despite this, the sheriff's office ruled the case as an accidental drowning, stating, her dogs were running loose when the family members and the sheriff's department first met over there. Possibly she was playing with the dogs and fell in. Friends and family argued against this theory, noting that the 28-year-old never went near the pond during the winter months, as there was simply no reason for her to do so. At some point after this, although it's unclear when, a family friend who went to feed Debbie's dogs found her wool stocking cap at the opposite end of the pond from where the police alleged the 28-year-old fell in. As there was a thin sheet of ice across the water's surface around this time, friends and family felt it was odd to find the cap there, because it likely hadn't been able to float across. But Debbie's case just grew stranger from here, when authorities began denying there was ever a barrel there in the first place. According to Jenny, after Debbie's body was pulled from the pond, Kevin and Gordon also recovered the barrel and left it on the edge. Jenny was told that the police would collect it the following morning, but by then, the barrel had vanished. Law enforcement dredged the pond to make sure it hadn't rolled back into the water, but it was nowhere to be found. Jenny, Kevin, and Gordon all insisted that the barrel had existed, along with a deputy who worked the case, but the remainder of the sheriff's office disputed its existence and said that the divers had likely mistaken Debbie's jacket, which may have ballooned up underneath the water due to the angle her body was at, for a barrel. Then, two months after Debbie's body was recovered, her mother was given the clothing she was found in. Jenny grew suspicious as she looked over the items, which included brown corduroy trousers which were too big and too long for her daughter, a 38C bra when Debbie wore a 34B, Nike shoes in a men's size 6 while Debbie's were a woman's size 7, a new regulation army field jacket which didn't belong to the 28-year-old nor her friends or family and had no name tag inside, and a black t-shirt with Pittsburgh Steelers on the front which friends and family had never seen before. Nobody was sure where it had come from. Although it could be that Debbie simply wanted some baggier clothing to lounge around in, and her bra could be explained because bra sizing is not standardized, what makes for some odd clues is that Debbie's trainers had no mud on them, and according to the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, the footwear hadn't been washed. Stranger still, Debbie actually already had an army jacket that had been passed down to her from her brother. The jacket was a size large and was found by her mother hanging up in her closet, so it was not the one she was found in. There are several theories in Debbie's case. Some online sleuths believe the police botched the investigation and attempted to cover their tracks afterwards, while others believe that law enforcement covered for one of their own or somebody who was close to them. Interestingly, if the barrel really did exist, the person who took it would either need to be someone incredibly fortunate in their timing, or somebody close to the investigation, as they managed to escape with the barrel without detection. It has also been speculated that Gordon Childress was involved with Debbie's disappearance and subsequent murder, because he was able to locate her body quickly. Additionally, he was unable to find the footprints and drag marks again when law enforcement emptied the pond. Still, there is no evidence tying Gordon to the crime. Jenny, however, had her own theory about what happened to her daughter. Part of Debbie's job involved being in charge of the hospital's volunteers, and it was here that the 28-year-old had caught the attention of not one, but two of the men volunteering. Neither has ever been publicly identified, but it is believed that one of them was the man who left the voicemail. This individual expressed to Debbie that he wanted to be more than friends, but she declined his advances. The second volunteer was described as having psychiatric issues and being much more forceful than the first. Debbie had rejected him on numerous occasions, informing him that she already had a boyfriend, but he continued to persist. Both these men were interviewed, but the second man had a solid alibi and refused to take a polygraph test. He left the state just days after Debbie's body was found. Jenny proposed that one of these volunteers stalked Debbie, found her address, and drove her to another location using her own vehicle, where he sexually assaulted and killed her before returning her home and dumping her body in the pond. Whether or not Debbie was sexually assaulted is still up for debate. A former police officer from North Carolina, Dr. Maurice Godwin, 
claimed on his website that case files showed Debbie had been, but that the vaginal swab had been lost since. A DNA profile was never created using the swab before it went missing, as that technique was not used in the same way it is today. However, Dr. Goodwin is the only one to mention this fact, and other articles that mention it list him as the primary source. Debbie Wolfe's case is still unsolved. Sadly, her two brothers, stepfather, and mother have all passed away in the years since. Jenny searched for answers until her death in 2002. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.